let's go over to Ukraine and to uh, our favorite Al Hassan Bello. Uh, uh, how are you? I'm fine. Okay. Uh, so who is this? This is um, the Ukrainian president, mm -hmm. Volodymyr Zelensky. And then we have Putin. These are yeah. the two belligerents in this conflict. Okay. And then we have Biden being the face of NATO. In terms of military power, can we, is it clear that Russia is stronger than Ukraine? Absolutely. Absolutely. Understood. So it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. sticking feet for Russia to yeah. go in. What's the latest? Have the Russians moved in? Yeah, they've advanced so far towards um, Kiev. But then let's understand two things here. Mm -hmm. In dealing with great powers, I've heard a lot of things about international law. Mm -hmm. International law legally take effect on smaller states. When it comes to great powers or super powers, you have to look at facts, actions, and history. Mm -hmm. Because no one holds them to account. And then this attempt to make Putin look as if he's an aggressor in this context. To understand how we got here, we must go back to history. Has Russia ever interfered into the Western affairs or the Western affairs interfered into Russia? But to understand Putin's mindset, there's one particular statement he made in the past. Mm -hmm. Take us through it. About, about the collapse we of should Union. acknowledge that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a major geopolitical disaster mm -hmm. of the century. As for the Russian nation, it became a genuine drama. Tens of millions of uh, co-citizens and co-patriots found themselves outside Russian territory. Moreover, the epidemic of disintegration infected Russia itself. So right from the word go, he's complaining about the disintegration of the Federation yeah. by the, uh, their defeat in the yeah. Cold War, as it were. Okay, so, this, so, so, so Putin had a mind to reunite the Federation at some point. Not recreate really Soviet Union per se. But then you need to look at why is Russia aggressive today. But then let's look at two things now. This statement, in comparison to his statement when he ordered the attack on Ukraine, he promised to denazify Ukraine and demilitarize it. Mm -hmm. But this statement is said equally as some undertone of Nazi rhetoric. We understand when Hitler was trying to embark on his offensive, one of his arguments was that some Germans were left outside the borders of Germany, which he met. Including Austria and all of those places. Yeah, not Austria, mm -hmm. Southern Land, in mm -hmm. Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. and some portion of Allen and Lorraine that was given to what do you call it? Um, so Hitler was trying France. to unite Germany. Unite Germans outside the German border. Mm -hmm. So if Putin is talking about bringing Russians outside the Russian border, then it has some Nazi undertones itself. So in contrast to his... I don't agree with you, but go on. No, his... Because Hitler's argument mm -hmm. that led to the war itself, Hitler's argument was broader than that. Hitler thought that the German, the, core, the German ideology was the purest. But the core and of the argument... that you control the world. But the core of the argument was that the German race must first of all be under one united government and then before he embark on his onslaught yes. to dominate the world. Yes, the, the German race was the highest race yeah. and the Jewish race was yeah. a greedy race. Yeah. So he wanted to eliminate the Jews who he said they were greedy yeah. and that's what accounted for the Holocaust and then to unite Germany and sell that German philosophy compulsorily to the rest of the world. That's the point about so the So the Second link world. between Putin's statement here and denazification which contrasts the fact that you also want to bring Russians outside the border of Russia, back into Russia. Mm -hmm. And that perhaps might influence his, what do you call it, um, aggressive move. But then we need to go back to Western interference into Russian affairs. Mm -hmm. this, this is Viktor Yanukovych, mm -hmm. the president who was overthrown by a popular revolution that has Western endorsement. In Ukraine? In Ukraine. Okay. And since then, Russia became very spectacular. Mm -hmm. But then, to understand how Russia became Westernized, we have to go back to Peter the Great, mm -hmm. who ruled Russia from 1682 to 1725. Prior to that, this was how the Russians were look culturally. This was their cultural dressing. This is Russian cultural dressing. Yeah. Okay. But he had to adopt Western lifestyle. He, Peter? Peter the Great. Imposed, per se, lack of, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. Western standards on the Russian people. And ever since then, the marriage between Russia and the West has never been a smooth one. So you're saying that Peter the Great was the one who tried to bring Russia into the he West? He tried to westernize Russian culture, the mm -hmm. Russian people entirely. Westernize it by making it Italian, By English, making it more... Spanish? You know, he, you know he traveled across Europe. Yeah. Visited a lot of sheep. He had adopted technology and so many things. This is, this is classic like Italian, Mona Lisa type of, you know, yeah. type but of culture at the time. But this is because he was more Europeanized in his outlook. Mm -hmm. But this was the typical did, Russian. Did he feel, did Peter the Great feel that European civilization has something that the Russians should learn from? Is that why he did that? Yeah, perhaps he felt that if he doesn't pursue, you know, he, perhaps he associated westernization with modernization. So if he doesn't join the trend, Russia might lag behind. Mm -hmm. Fine. It, it yielded results. Mm -hmm. Russia was a great power throughout the century. Yeah. But then let's look at, this was during the Cold War. Yeah. And mind you, the Cold War itself ended because Gorbachev mm -hmm. initiated dialogue. Mm -hmm. So if you look at 
Russia and trying to portray Russia to the be Cold the Cold War did it end? Yeah, it ended. The East was defeated. The Berlin Wall collapsed. But prior to that, there were a series of dialogue. Yeah, but but, but uh, uh, him, Gorbachev. Was, uh, Gorbachev was in trouble with Perestroika. Perestroika was an economic policy that was a total disaster. Russia was poor and broke. America was rich and strong. Britain was rich and strong. France was rich and so strong. Russia was so coming to 1990, the Cold War, Russia could not survive. Was, no, but even at that time, mm -hmm. Soviet Union was economically weak. Very. Because of, well, people think but because of But it was not America. militarily weak. And it was not yes, easy. Yes, I can And agree no with US that. president would have attempted to attack Russia militarily at that point. They didn't need to attack Russia itself. They just needed to collapse the legs that Russia was standing on around the world. And that's it. So if you had Germany coming to say that East Germany, coming to say that we want to unite with West Germany, it's an economic question. But there was, we'll get back to that. Yeah. That also has an implication in this current situation. Okay. So now let's go back to this map. So this is the map. This is the map of Europe. So where's Russia? This is Russia. Okay. This is Ukraine. And these two countries formed the core of Soviet Union in terms of its industrial mm -hmm. output. So where was Estonia? Part of the Soviet Union? Yeah, these were part of the Soviet Union. L Latvia, Latvia, part of the Soviet Latvia, Union. Belarus, Lithuania, part of the Belarus. Soviet Belarus. Union. And like, what's Russia? This, this is, is a Russian Russia. enclave. Kaliningrad. Okay. Yeah, Kaliningrad. Poland this was not part of the Soviet Union. But, but was part of the... Belarus was part of the Soviet yeah. Union? But there was an alliance between the Poland people and the Russian that was, Federation. That was what you call it, during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And that takes us back to why is Russia insecure today. So we need to move this way. This is the ethnic map of Russia, um, mm -hmm. Ukraine. Mm -hmm. These are Russian-speaking areas, mm -hmm. which is ethnic Russia mm -hmm. itself. But then around this side, where you have predominantly Russian-speaking people, it's mm -hmm. just like the way we speak Hausa in Ghana today. Yes. Most of this Hausa is... Hausa is not in Nigeria. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and some part of Niger. Okay. Even though we have ethnic houses in Ghana, we're born here. But majority of the Ghanaian speaking houses speak a second language. So this side are Russian speaking. Mm -hmm. But they're not necessarily ethnic Russians. Okay. But this side are ethnic Russians. And so, so the light blue is Russian speaking. Yeah. But they're not Russians. Yeah. This side is Russian. Russian speaking. So the people who Russian. speak Russia, who are they? Tribe. You know, Counter. one of the policies of Stalin during the World Vladimir War II. Vladimir Stalin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, Vladimir St Stalin. No, it was Vladimir no, in, Lenin. No, Joseph Stalin. Rather. Joseph Stalin. Joseph One Stalin, of his Vladimir policy Lenin. was that when there is internal revolt, mm -hmm. and it's the imperial history of Russia, they take away the ethnic people within that domain and then bring Russians there. So they russify their place and take away the ethnic people. So in this part, the Cossacks around this part mm -hmm. were largely taken from the place, deported out of their ancestral homeland, and Russians were brought there to change the ethnic, more like ethnic cleansing. But because it was an internal affair of the Soviet Union, you, know, you can't label it as ethnic cleansing. Likewise, in the, in the era of, in the situation of Crimea, mm -hmm. the Tatars were evicted mm -hmm. for Russia to be brought, so the population yes, yes. was swapped. Mm -hmm. That's how come we have some of these people here. Okay. But then, between the East and the West, that is Russia and the West, who has interfered to the affair of the other? This takes us back to history. In 1812, we had Napoleon, Napoleonic French invading mm -hmm. Russia. During the Russian Civil War, it was an attempt by the West, collectively, America, French, Italian, the, the list goes on, including the dominions of India, backing the, what do you call it, the Kerensky's government against the Soviet revolution, mm -hmm. just to cripple the revolution. And likewise, you had the German offensive, Operation Barbarossa. These were Western countries interfering either directly or indirectly with the affairs of Russia. Mm -hmm. That created a sense of, what do you call it, distrust and anxiety when the West get close to Russia, mm -hmm. among the Russians. Mm -hmm. And so, what were the Russian response to that event? In the first two events of the French invasion and the Russian Civil War, you had a theory of defense in depth, where you withdraw and slow your enemy's offensive. By slowing your enemy's offensive, you destroy everything around, so you weaken his energy, his resolve and determination for you to mount a counterattack. Okay, let's come back to the recent situation. So Russia's reason for invading Ukraine today is what? It has to do with security. It has to do with these two core things. In the first instance, Russia soak the pressure. What pressure? The invasion. Of who? First of all, the French invasion, Napoleonic invasion. Oh, that's it. old. I'm talking about right now. I'm, I'm building point to that. But post-World War II, mm -hmm. they realized that we cannot keep soaking the pressure. So they changed their theory. They decided to seek for strategic depth. Now that we had the Warsaw Pact whereby you had the Eastern Bloc, mm -hmm. where they made countries like Poland, East Germany, Romania, a buffer mm -hmm. between Soviet Union proper and NATO. So, likewise today, it is an attempt to build that buffer 
the Russia has adopted as a strategic Let player. me just announce that uh, it's 11.15. We are not done with Bello yet. We have to go off Metro TV. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Pasta is coming in. And uh, social media, you can continue to see Al Hassan Bello. Those who don't have social media, tomorrow morning when he goes to the office, check it out. The, the video will be on there. Thank you for watching on uh, Metro TV. We continue on social media. Thank so you. So it's the same attempt to have that buffer that the Cold War gives the Soviet Union that is making Putin become very nervous today. But let's ask ourselves a simple question. If Putin was to station troop in Mexico, Venezuela mm -hmm. or Cuba, will America be using dialogue of force? Cuba is still being punished today yeah. for accepting... No, what's the point you're making is that Russia is justified to go to Ukraine? Perhaps the means. What is the point? The Why point, are they the invading point another that, sovereign state? The point is very clear. Mm -hmm. Great powers understood. There was a series of agreements. Even it wasn't categorically stated mm -hmm. that NATO wouldn't expand eastward. But tacitly, it implies that NATO wouldn't go eastward. And if anyone has breached the agreement, then it's the West. Where, where, where is NATO expanding to? Do you have a map to show us? Okay, these are, I have a, what do you call it? NATO expansion, and you will see. No, no, no. I think NATO expansion. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Ever since NATO was formed in 1940, in 1949, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these were the initial founding members, mostly Western Europe. By 1999, NATO started enlarging eastward. So you had Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland. But these are sovereign states who have agreed to join NATO. Why is Russia worried about that? It has to do with, uh, let's see. There's this agreement that allowed the unifi reunification of, what do you call it, um, Germany. Mm -hmm. In the reunification of Germany, the two plus, the two plus uh, four agreement stated that even in the eastern flank of Germany, the former Eastern Republic, there was not supposed to be NATO troops or missile stationed there. Mm -hmm. And the mind you, you have this NFT, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, that was recently abrogated by Trump. It regulated the movement of troops or station of missiles between Russia as in Soviet Union. No, let's come back to the question. Why is Russia invading Ukraine? What's the point? Just fable grounds that its security is being threatened. Russia's security is being threatened by Ukraine. By NATO, in, NATO expansion towards its border. So which, any, which border? You know... Let's get the map again. Let's get the map again. No, I'm saying that the inclusion of huh? Poland, yes. Czechoslovakia, uh -huh. takes away that strategic depth that Soviet Union has created. No, where, this is Russia. This is Ukraine. This is where is Belarus? Where, which country is in NATO? All these ones are now NATO. Where? Poland. Poland. Uh -huh. Czech Republic. Hungary. Okay, so Russia wants to annex Ukraine to stop Ukraine from joining NATO. Yeah, because if... But if is that something... Can we go and annex Togo to stop them from joining Comesa? Well, it depends on where we look at it. If we look at it from strictly legal angle... Yeah, but this aggression cannot be justified in international law at then all. What, what justifies U.S. going to Iraq in 2003? Biological weapons. Biological weapons. Yes. Uh, were they able to present the facts? No, they couldn't. But at the time, they knew that the biological weapons were there. You can talk post the event and but, say that there were no but, biological weapons. But the reasons they gave... Whether it's justified is a reason. What's the reason for Russia going into Ukraine? It's not security. So whether it's justifiable or not, the first act on the ground. That's why I said when we're dealing with great powers, two things must be very important, the facts and the actions. The fact is that... How do you think America is going to resist this? To also go into Ukraine or to attack Russia directly or attack Russian establishments elsewhere? I think the, the Ukrainians miscalculated. They should have learned from the fact that NATO does not have the balls to confront Russia. No, you're talking about the United States here. It will, even if it will go, it has to go through NATO, triggering the Article 5. No, it, it, it can go in defense of Ukraine you know, for external it. aggression. Yes. No, they'll get the Security Council support. But Russia has a veto there, so how would they pass Yeah, it? but they'll get the, the General Assembly support. But nothing makes it binding until the Security Council approves. Or, or yes, then America can go in defense of Ukraine. Yes, in defense of Ukraine. Even in his wildest dream, mm -hmm. Biden wouldn't try that. Yeah, but he's indicated that he will. He should try. What's the, what's the, what's the threat? He can't. Why? Russia is not as weak as people want us to look at it. Mm -hmm. It's military, economically not strong enough to fight a prolonged war. But if there's any country that has proven that it has the, 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 the ability to withstand aggression and invasion, it's Russians. Let's talk about economics. Um, so let's, I saw a slide yeah. where you put the economics over there. I think that's what is important to people. Uh, yes, Africa's import from Russia. Yeah. Is, that, is that what you've lined up? Yeah, this is so Africa's, what is it? Africa's import total 4 billion from Russia. Every year, per annum. Yeah. This really is the 4 billion dollar. amount of, uh, of things are imported yeah. from Russia. So 90% of what? Wheat, sunflower oil, barley, soybeans comes from 
what do you call it? Russia. Russia. And did Russia and Ukraine. Which African countries are in, are in this import Mostly business? Mostly the huge importers are Kenya, Nigeria, Egypt, Sudan, Algeria. But we have other. But what it implies. Okay, but the names you mentioned are the big importers big from in, Russia. Yeah. And they are importing usually wheat, sunflower yeah. oil, <coughs> uh, barley, and soya yeah. bean. And from Ukraine, there's 2.9 billion, billion coming into Africa. Yeah. But 48 percent of which three yeah. percent of maize energy uh, which countries are, are, are importing from ukraine the same huge countries oh okay okay but then okay what it implies is that since these two countries are the largest exporters of wheat and the rest so we both close down whether you import directly or not mm -hmm. a disruption in the supply chain affect the price on the international market and yes, that yes, affects yes. the cost of things so of wheat sunflower barely yeah. soybean okay that's and then important. when it comes to energy russia is the second largest exporter of oil in the to world. the world after yeah. Saudi Arabia yeah that's why you have the or the, the, the hike in oil prices mm -hmm. and there's another thing we, also, we, are, we need to look at the security implication for West Africa precisely mm -hmm. that's what I'm interested in mind you in 2019 we were just a month away from the presidential election in Libya when Khalifa Haftar with the backing of Wagner group embarked on his offensive to capture Tripoli even though due to Turkish intervention that resulted in a stalemate that we have gotten back now Despite the attempt to reunite the two rival governments, we still have the division today. So if Russia wants to expand the domain of the warfare, it could also challenge Western interests in Africa. Mind you, France has just been dislodged out of Mali through a combined force of Russia. So any instability that comes out of that region, Mali, Libya, continue to affect. And most of the coup d'etats we have today in West Africa are premised on the ground of the field of the states to secure so, meaning further instability could mean further coup d'etat. So, Africa's concern here should be the importation of these things. Yeah, the cost of these things. Uh, which is affecting big populations in Africa. Nigeria and yeah. Egypt alone is over nearly 300 yeah. million. And, that will and Kenya, Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya is about 300 million people. And if, uh, if they are going to have supply chain disruptions and prices are going to go up in these areas, they will be looking for alternatives. So, yeah. But then basic commodity was... Ghana so doesn't do wheat. We can send them wheat. But basic commodity, well, the cost of basic commodities like bread and product of these things, flour... Yeah, for bread. those who are doing uh, brown bread, who are importing the yeah. wheat, maybe bread. from Nigeria, they are most likely importing it through from Nigeria, which has come from Russia. So we should expect hiking so, basic commodities. Yeah. So that's bread. not very good. And then my... Com my Especially as we're talking about post-COVID. That's, that's, yeah. that's a concern. Yeah, you were saying. And then the security situation is very important. If the coups are premised on the ground of the field of the state to secure their borders from the militants, so further instability then promise further coup d'etat if care is not taken. But Russia is fighting a war in Ukraine. They will not be able to sustain a war in, in, in Africa but against France. They've they shown they have the tenacity. Yeah, but France, you, said, were, you said they cannot have a prolonged war. They were fighting. France is going to be stronger in Mali and Niger and, is, and Burkina than Russia. Right now that Russia has to concentrate on Ukraine, they most likely have lost their African interest. that is interest. why, unlike U.S. and the Western world, that go with their main force. Russia is element of plausible deniability. Yeah, you said that before. Is that what they are doing now? No, that's, that, now they're so going with their main so, force. So I'm saying no. For Ukraine looks like they're going with their main in force. The, Vladimir in, Putin in has the, said he's going to Ukraine. In Ukrainian instant, they yeah. are making a clear statement. Yes, that they are going there. They are going but to fight. But in the fringes, they can decide to use their other options. Their plus yeah, but you need resources to support that. Oh, but they can. Yeah, but you said they can't fight a the prolonged war coming. because if the economic you look situation at, is not that look And at. if they are the, the world's second uh, largest exporter of oil, that may be a big cash in for them. If they don't continue to supply oil to the world for the next three months, but that's a significant loss of revenue. This, they had this agreement with China to supply China with crude oil in yes. this amount. Yes. And then we need to look at the Chinese implication here. Mm -hmm. There was this agreement, tacit agreement between Putin and then um, Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. You know, China also has a claim on Taiwan. Taiwan, yes. So US posture and NATO's action will either embolden Xi Jinping to also invade Taiwan in the future or deter him. Mm -hmm. So this is also NATO's, uh, it's like more like saying NATO has beaten more than it can chew. I, I'm not sure they expected Russia to strike. Oh, they had been saying that, they had predicted that. No, but they thought... The last two weeks, they thought uh, that Biden and, and uh, Boris Johnson have been saying that Russia is going to strike. It became too obvious that they couldn't deny, but they thought the threat of sanction could cripple, could deter Putin. But then if anything has, if anything, Israel has shown anything. So how do you see it over the next two weeks? Because we have to wrap up. The next two weeks? Yeah. I think, well, I don't know if Russia will be going for total annexation. Because that will mean what? They enter Ukraine, take the flag, change the president. What that would mean you, you, you capture the whole country. So now we have... Capture the whole country and tell the people in the country to do what? You impose on your own administration. So you remove the president? That, was what, that, is, a, that is one scenario. And you remove the parliament? Yeah. You remove the judiciary? 
You just take away the, the future of the entire Ukraine. How do you run the economy, the day-to-day? -day? How, how do you run the supply chain systems? How do you do that? Well, you have, you have to see. Do they speak the same language? I think because of the issue of Soviet Union, they understand each other's language. Does the Ukrainian army have ability to resist something? Well, single-handedly, it cannot. What's the, what's the view of the Ukrainian population? How many are they? It depends on the angle you stand for. How many are the population in, in About 43 million. 43 million is not it's a significant number. So if you are on the Barosha, has about 144 million. Yeah, but the 140 are not going to come into Ukraine. So the issue is that if you are here... So you have 43 million people to deal with. But that doesn't mean you have 43 million combatants. No, not combatants, but people. These days, in the modern world, anybody can be a combatant. But a lot they of can throw anything at you. Of, a lot of people are also fleeing. The people in Hezbollah and Hamas, they don't have guns, so but they are combatants. Hezbollah is the most... Armed, well, but they work with stones. It works. Hezbollah. Yeah, they work with Have stones. Hamas. Hezbollah. Is Hamas works with stones. I it can works. bet Hezbollah is so much, the citizens, Hezbollah is more citizens than are Ghana. not are not uh, so, unable so, to join so the war. So I'm saying that if you are around this side, mm -hmm. around this side, perhaps Putin can count, can count um, about fifty percent support, if not sixty percent, because is this blue part part of Ukraine? These are part of Ukraine. This but blue the, is part of Ukraine. Yeah, but these so are, the yellow is what the real Ukrainians. So this place up uh, the, the real Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. And then these parts, collectively, mm -hmm. are Russian speaking. But the decision is that these parts are ethnic Russians. So that is the Russian onslaught, in the, is it included in the Russian onslaught in terms of policy, that they would divide this and add this to Russia so Ukraine can have that? If you look at the law that was passed in the Russian Duma, it recognized the two republics. It recognized these two as separate countries. It recognized Luhansk mm -hmm. and Donetsk as separate republics. From Ukraine. From Ukraine. Automatically, it does two things. It either technically violates Ukrainian sovereignty or delegitimizes the entire Ukrainian entity in the eyes of the Russian government. So far, most of the attacks initially were concentrated on the cities in the east. Odessa, Mariupol, what do you call it, Kharkiv. Mm -hmm. But going towards Kiev becomes a bit... Kiev is the capital. It's the capital. And it's most in the interior. So now... But that's the press. So Russia must get there to be able to change so government. The, oh, they're almost there. In Kiev. Yeah. So now we are at the stage of invasion. We don't know whether it becomes an occupation or it's just a decapitation strike. But the NATO's response will determine. Putin's decision demand is just one. A written guarantee that NATO will not expand eastward. And it's specifically so because... With the previous treaty that was signed during the collapse of the Soviet Union, it wasn't categorically written, but the West never respected it. But if you look at the Cuba Missile Crisis of 1962, it wasn't a written agreement. It was a verbal agreement, but the Soviet respected and pulled out. So the question is, if verbal agreement was binding on the Soviet Union, any success is Russia. Or oh, the agreement for Soviet Union to pull out of Cuba. To pull out its missiles and military out of Cuba. Which they were doing to support Fidel Castro. Yeah, was verbally. Mm. But they pulled out. But they pulled out. So why is and America had their way. Yeah. And America has even never forgiven Cuba. And even if we look at, say, if we begin to say that you, your Russia is what you call it, violating Ukrainian sovereignty. Yes, it is. Has, Russia, has U.S. respect other people's sovereignty? Like Panama? Cuba itself. Cuba has its own presence. U.S. is still in possession of Guantanamo Bay. Yes, yes, they are. Which was part of their plot agreement. Mm -hmm. But when Castro came to power, he requested for the return of that territory. U.S. refused. And there was an amount of money that U.S. is supposed to be paying to Cuba. The Cuban government, out of moral ground, despite its improvised nature, has refused to accept that money. So by refusing to return a portion of Cuban territory to Cuba, that is U.S. challenging Cuban sovereignty. But it's cool when U.S. does the same. When Russia does it, they want to shout. Okay, Alassane Bello is pointing to the uh, um, inequality in the international realm. We'll end there unless you have something to conclude. But then there's this Final thing that we must look at, um, Trump is mm -hmm. on the side of his ally. Russia. Putin. Putin. Has he said that? Yeah. Let's and, see. And let's see. Are, you, know, you know, what? what another let's way, see what Trump is saying. But let me add this before we go. Mm -hmm. The class of Soviet Union, two class image in, in Soviet Union, two class. The oligarchs and the politicians, Yeltsin and his ally. And another set of people were those who were affiliated with the military, Putin and his KGB cohort. They are revisionists, and that's why we have here today. They are not in charge, and they want to reshape the history of the region. But then, as is usual of Trump, this is what he said. Uh, he says, um, he was quoting, but here is a guy that says, you know, I'm going to declare a big portion of Ukraine independent. He used 
the, well, the word independent. And we are going to go out and we are going to go in and we are going to go help keep peace. you got to say that's pretty savvy. Sorry. What does that mean? His president Putin was being smart and whatever he says is cool. <laughs>